All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Amisha. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and it is my privilege to serve as the executive director for UConn Global Health Spaces on campus. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the first day of our fifth annual Global Health Symposium, Connecting People, Place, and Health. For those of you that are joining us for the first time today, Global Health Spaces on Campus was established in 2018 by a group of passionate undergraduate students from many departments and schools at UConn, all united by a common goal to establish the university as a global health center across the country. Since then, we have organized four annual global health conferences, engaged hundreds of students and faculty in the global health conversation, networked with changemakers across the globe, and gained national and international recognition for organization and symposium. In our efforts to engage students and professionals from all disciplines in global health changemaking, we have established an annual global health hackathon, which for the past three years in a row has welcomed students from all academic and pre-professional interests to come together to develop solutions to the world's most pressing global health issues. This year's symposium held today and tomorrow seeks to explore the connections between people, place, and health and allows us to better understand how we must view these three factors all together in order to build a healthier future. Before we start our event to get today, we would like to begin by acknowledging Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pugasset, Lenape, and Nipmunk peoples whose traditional lands we currently stand on. We recognize and respect indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and the land. It is also worth noting that the town of Mansfield and by extension, the University of Connecticut's existence and legacy would not be possible without the labor of enslaved black people. We acknowledge, respect and honor those whose forced labor allows us to work, live and learn in this space. Global health work does not happen in an isolated bubble. It is a complex and diverse field one that requires innovative and interdisciplinary solutions. The fight for a healthier world does not just rely on doctors. It calls upon engineers, lawyers, nurses, artists, policymakers, writers, and social entrepreneurs. It calls for technological innovation, legal and political support, competence in human rights, and an understanding of history, anthropology, sociology, and psychology. Global health is at the intersection of all of these fields. And I'm happy to have all of you from a very diverse range of universities and backgrounds attending here today. Regardless of professional or personal interest, everyone can make a difference in the field of global health. Over the course of this weekend, we hope to immerse ourselves and all of you in this vast field of global health. We will discuss not only health inequities in the United States and across the globe, but also help you understand the common underlying socioeconomic geopolitical and cultural determinants that contribute to them. We will have the opportunity to look at the nuances of healthcare, acknowledge the hurdles that exist, and critically think of how we can craft creative, culturally competent solutions to those problems. We encourage you to keep an open mind and an eager heart and learn from not just our presenters, from, but from also from one another. We encourage you to start thinking about how you can take what you learned this weekend and apply it to your everyday life and possible future career path. We hope you walk away from this weekend knowing that you have the ability to have a huge impact on the fields of global health and that every one of you has a critical role to play in breaking down barriers and building a healthier, more connected world. And by choosing to be here today, you have already taken your first step towards working for a more equitable world, one where every individual has access to quality and affordable health care, regardless of their backgrounds, beliefs, or circumstances. UConn Global Health Spaces on Campus proudly presents our fifth annual Global Health Symposium, Connecting People, Place, and Health. On that note, I would like to welcome and introduce our first keynote speaker for our symposium this weekend. Dr. Joya Mukherjee is a physician, educator, and activist, trained in infectious disease, internal medicine, pediatrics, and public health. Since 2000, Dr. Mukherjee has served as the Chief Medical Officer of Partners in Health, an international medical organization with programs in the United States, Haiti, Rwanda, Lesotho, Malawi, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Peru, Mexico, Russia, Kazakhstan, and the Navajo Nation, and now in the COVID-19 pandemic in cities and states 
across the U.S. Dr. Mukherjee coordinates and supports PIH's efforts to provide high-quality, comprehensive health care to the poorest and most vulnerable. She's an associate professor at the Division of Global Health Equity at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Mukherjee is also on the faculty at the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. Joya teaches infectious disease, global health delivery, and human rights to health professionals and students from all around the world, and directs the master's degree program in global health delivery at Harvard Medical School. She is the author of Introduction to Global Health Delivery, Practice, Equity, Human Rights, Second Edition, published in 2021 by Oxford University Press. Her scholarship focuses on the health delivery, universal health coverage, and human rights. Joya is a mother and a singer. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Mukherjee. Um, okay. Can everyone see my screen or can you, Amisha? Um, yes, I can see your screen. Okay. All right. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I am in Liberia, so you can actually see I'm in a hotel room. It's 1030 at night, but I'm, I'm very happy to be with you. I'm always um, delighted to, to talk to students and um, particularly those interested in these important topics. So today I'm going to talk about health and human rights. And I love the introduction Amisha gave. Uh, the way many of you now approach thinking about the land, thinking about enslavement, um, and thinking about what global health means uh, in relationship to this political economy is to me very important and part of a much broader work to have a fairer and more just society. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the way I think about human rights uh, and health and the way we have looked at it at, at the organization um, that I'm with Partners in Health. So when we look at injustice and in health, there is a 30 year, more than 30 year life expectancy between countries like where I'm sitting in Liberia and the United States, um, about 25 years, 60, mid 60s to early 80s. Um, and then there is a third can be up to a 30 year difference in life expectancy within countries. So um, in, in just my city of Boston alone, if you are to take the the orange line of the our subway, the MBTA, from Roxbury Station, a predominantly black neighborhood, to Back Bay Station, a predominantly white and affluent neighborhood, there is a 30 year difference in life expectancy. So what is that about? That is not about genetics. That is not about um, behaviors. That is really about the structured inequalities uh, that exist. And what we see is that Africans, whether in Africa or in those in the diaspora, bear a disproportionate burden of premature death, as do indigenous people. In the United States, we know that zip code or postal code correlates more with health outcomes than any factor, include, you know, including genetics. So I think we spend a lot of time in pre-med and medical school studying biology and the human genome, which is very important, but we spend far too little time trying to understand the impact of social and political forces on health. And, you know, I think, again, what gives me a lot of hope is many of you are thinking about that much earlier than I ever did or than we ever did. This is a, a painting by Marc Chagall. Um, it's about Moses uh, parting the waters uh, for the people of Israel to cross. And one of the, the reasons I use this image is that uh, there's a famous spiritual called Wade in the Water, and it says that God's going to trouble the water. And I like the term troubling the water rather than just parting the water, because what I have learned in my years uh, of doing global health work, being an activist, is that you don't just simply change things, you struggle for them to be changed, you trouble uh, the status quo. 
And there is no real improvement in human rights without an act of struggle. Um, and as a person who considers myself a very interested student in uh, social movements, I've never seen anything that didn't have some element of trouble in it. And we've heard our uh, great uh, departed John Lewis talk about uh, good trouble. And so when we think about improvements in human rights, sadly, people are not sitting around scratching their heads and saying, hmm, how do, how do we make human rights better? By and large, it's an active struggle of some sort. So um, I'm going to just uh, ask, I don't know if, can people participate or, or not really? Amisha. Somewhat, they can, so it depends on, is it just uh, responding to questions? There's some people are watching on YouTube, so I'm not sure we'll be able to get there. Okay, all right. Well, I'll just talk and then we can have, maybe have a discussion later. So, um, you know, what, what we see in the world is that the modern notion of human rights um, really comes from the, the Holocaust in the, in the 20, 20th century. Um, the Nuremberg trials of 1948 really uh, tried to give uh, punishment and responsibility for the Holocaust to certain people. But there was the sense that a government, in this case, the Nazi government, the German government, the elected government, could not do certain things to their own people. And that was actually quite novel in 1948, because prior to that time, what you did to your own people was actually considered a matter of sovereignty. So, you know, if, if, the United States was uh, committing genocide against native people uh, or having Jim Crow laws that was considered internal business. But the idea of human rights as a as a global doctrine, as a as a declaration was something quite different, saying everyone, whatever country you're in, whatever citizenship you hold or do not hold, has a, a, a right to a certain basic set of rights. So. This is the committee that drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You see just one woman, uh, no Africans uh, or uh, black people. Um, so there were definitely some limitations, uh, but it was not only a Western phenomenon. Uh, you know, a Lebanese person w drove a lot of uh, the work, as did a, a Chilean. Um, the, China was very much involved. And so it was more diverse, perhaps, than many things at the time. And so in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was penned. Uh, the middle person there, Eleanor Roosevelt, who had been the first lady of the United States, uh, was the most visible champion of this. And every country uh, signed on to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so that is where we take our modern notion of human rights from. And if you reflect, as many of you have seen pictures of the liberation of the, the concentration camps in the Holocaust, what you will remember is extremely thin, emaciated people, and that people were worked to death, starved to death, uh, didn't have any kind of hygiene, uh, medical care, uh, you know, med medicine was used uh, as experiments. So many terrible things, people's liberty was taken away. They were forcibly uh, deported. And so the human, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I would encourage you to read, you can find it on the website um, uh, of the UN. It's, it's very short. And it basically tried to say that these are the rights that everyone should have regardless of country of origin. So those included the right to food, the right to housing, the right to a fair wage for your labor, the white right to not be incarcerated without a trial. It also included the right to vote, the right to have free speech and assembly uh, and to have a fair trial, etc. So it's very comprehensive. And as I mentioned, almost all countries, uh, actually Russia and South Africa uh, abstained, uh, but the rest of the countries in the world um, supported that Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
And that that is, you know, as I said, what we go from today. But the Universal Declaration was a declaration. It is not a treaty. It has no legal weight. So very little was done to enforce or trying to make laws from the Universal Declaration until about 1966. So, uh, so the Universal Declaration had two key points in it of the overarching framework. One is that a government has the responsibility, the duty to respect, protect, and fulfill rights. Um, so that's one pole of sort of what human rights work is. The other pole is that the citizenry, civil society, uh, should hold governments accountable, right? So these are kind of the two poles, the dialectic uh, tension that would create and advance human rights. But not a lot was done with this um, great document. Uh, 30 articles, um, as I said, very comprehensive. Um, and yet, in even uh, as soon after the Second World War as 1952, uh, there were most of Africa was were still under col colonial rule. Um, here is an example of Britain uh, in 1952 setting up a series of concentration camps that targeted 1.5 million Kikuyu based on their. Um, their uh, ethnicity. Uh, there were many different forms. We still had very severe Jim Crow laws in the United States. South Africa still had apartheid. And so, you know, these declarations uh, were nice in theory, but they were not uh, enforced. Uh, yet at around that time in the 50s and the 60s, we had the great liberation struggles of Africa. Um, here you see Kwame Nkrumah, Amakar Cabral, Jomo Kenyatta, and Haile Selassie. Um, and, and these leaders all talked about human rights, the right to health, particularly education, um, and they really wanted to realize these rights for the people of their country. And so, as I said, not much was done with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights until 1966. And then something happened that made people dust off that declaration and say, maybe we need treaties. Treaties are legal documents. They're binding in a, in a certain way. Um, and a country signs them and then ratifies them. Ratifies means you put the language into your law. Um, and so there isn't a real way to hold people accountable internationally. But if you sign them and you put them in your law, then there are uh, federal government ways to enforce them. And so for, for those of you who've been fo following things like the um, Ahmaud Arbery trial or uh, the George Floyd, uh, uh, you know, not the, Ahmaud, uh, the, the people who killed Ahmaud Arbery or the people who killed George Floyd, what you see is they talk about the sort of local case and then the federal case. And the federal civil rights cases were their civil rights violated. That is based on our treaty obligations. Um, and so those are federally you know, mandated based on that. So, but unfortunately, this great document, which was very comprehensive, was divided in two in 1966. One side was the right to water, the right to health, the right to education, the right to have a fair wage, to organize a labor movement. And on the other side, you had the right to speech, religion, vote, assembly, judiciary system. These one document was br broken into two documents. On the right, you had the what was called the Covenant on Social and Economic Rights. And on the other side, the left side, you had, excuse me, what was called the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And these divisions uh, were along the lines of the Cold War. And so the, the, treaty, um, the treaty on the, the right was one that was embraced by the Soviet Union, 
um, and socialist states and the and the treaty on the left over here, the civil and political rights, was embraced by Western democracies. Now, it's important to note that many, many countries signed on to both treaties, both the covenant on social and economic rights and the covenant on civil and political rights. Countries like uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Ireland, the UK, France, Canada, countries in the global south like Costa Rica. Um, and so many, many countries saw these things as interdependent as they were intended in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But what we saw was entrenched in the sides of the Cold War were Russia saying the right to health, water, education, etc., cetera, um, is paramount. And then the United States saying the right to speech, religion, voting, etc., cetera, is paramount. And to this day, actually, neither of those superpowers have signed on to the other treaty. So these human rights, unfortunately, have remained kind of polarized. And since we, the United States, won the Cold War, these rights, the civil and political rights, the right to speech, to religion, to vote, etc., uh, have been considered the most important rights. Some people say they're primary rights. Others say they're, they're negative rights. In fact, it's a way to keep the government out of your business, where these are sometimes called secondary rights or positive rights. But there's no real distinction of them in the Universal Declaration. It is only this historic architecture of the Cold War that separates them. So why does that matter in health? So, you know, governments only have a couple of different ways. This is not meant to be loads, it's meant to be loans. Governments only have a couple of different ways to generate revenue to fulfill rights, whatever they are, carrying out an election um, or having um, a health care plan. They can tax people. They can nationalize um, their resources like oil. Uh, Venezuela did that. Um, they can expand their empire, uh, go to places where they can get resources, uh, as we did in Iraq. Um, or they can take out loans uh, generally from the World Bank and the IMF. And the situation that African governments got into after independence is their um, people were not wealthy enough to contribute meaningfully to taxes. Uh, the, the wealthy people in the colonies had fled after independence and taken their money with them. It was difficult to nationalize resources because then you would have the American army on your back uh, because that is considered a socialist or communist thing to do. And we saw that with Patrice Lumumba, uh, who was assassinated, as well as Salvador Allende. Uh, empire and expansion is hard. And so many countries ended up taking out loans, uh, loans to promote whatever government strategy they had. So again, many of these revolutionary leaders were primarily concerned with social and economic rights, which are sometimes called poor people's rights. Putting bread on people's plates, making sure people had a roof over their head, a job and an education. But unfortunately, that uh, the loans ended up tied to an ideology uh, an ideology that is known as neoliberal capitalism. Neoliberal capitalism doesn't have anything to do with rights, but it was conflated with democracy. So if you have capitalism, you have democracy. And so um, countries that took out loans from the World Bank and the IMF uh, went, underwent a policy called structural adjustment. And structural adjustment just means to um, move things out of the public sector and privatize them. Uh, public sectors are considered big and not so helpful to the economy. This is particularly the neoliberal philosophy of uh, Milton Friedman, a Nobel Prize winning economist. Um, and so the World Bank suddenly has a lot of money and they start lending money and the average indebtedness started to rise um, even up to five to 10% a year and has continued to rise since then. And under those 
those loans, you had very explicit targets uh, or limits for government expenditures. And remember, the main government expenditures that any government has is health, education, infrastructure, and the military. And the military was, of course, exempt from these caps. So what I have sort of thought to call this is the great conflation, the conflating human rights, particularly the right to free speech, religion, vote, democracy, et cetera, with, with capitalism. Um, you know, and yet rights like the right to health are also part of a person's freedom. If you can't have freedom from illness, if you can't have freedom uh, to, uh, you know, to have a home, a roof over your head, that can restrict your freedom. But the, so much of World Bank and IMF was promoted in the Cold War as the strategy to build up capitalism as a bulwark to communism. And so, as I said, these rights the right to health, the right to water, red to education became completely marginalized. And human rights, you know, and you hear so much of this rhetoric even today in the United States about how we support human rights, we support democracy. Um, and right behind that comes, of course, capitalism. So this is the architect of, of this uh, work, a man named Milton Friedman I mentioned, and his book was actually Capitalism and Freedom. And he intended, in fact, to conflate these uh, things together. So the question is, what does that have to do with health? Um, and this is a long way of saying um, what I mentioned in the beginning is you can't really understand global health or health in a country like Liberia or uh, in a sovereign nation such as Navajo if you don't really look at the history that led us to the level of impoverishment that we have. Um, and so, you know, as the Cold War is going on, there was an important conference in Almaty, which is uh, Almaty, the city that is now known as Almaty, Kazakhstan. But remember that Kazakhstan was part of the Soviet Union in the 70s, and this conference at Almada was held by the Russia, the, the Soviet government. Um, but many people attended from all over the world, including three people from the United States, um, and they called for urgent and effective national and international action to develop primary care. And it was a very heady summit uh, with the promise of healthcare for all by the year 2000. And they talked a lot about the, the need for international solidarity to achieve health as a human right. But the same year, just a few months later, actually 1979, another article came out. Um, published this time not in a British journal, but in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, talking about uh, or putting forward an idea called selective primary health care. The idea of this was, well, countries don't have a lot of money, so what are the small things we can do to, you know, help and prevent disease? On one hand, it sounds quite logical, but on the other hand, we have to recognize why countries didn't have a lot of money because they were constrained by the World Bank and the IMF because they weren't able to nationalize their industry um, and they had very little tax base. So this selective primary health care was created from the reality that was created by the World Bank. Um, and so for, uh, and of course this uh, selective primary health care cost about two and a half dollars a day. So it fit very nicely in the public sector expenditure cap that was set by the World Bank and IMF. And so throughout most of the 20th century, there was let very little that passed for health care in countries like the ones I'm sitting in now in Liberia. You could go to a clinic and you might have a few sachets of oral rehydration solution, um, maybe a fridge stamped usually UNICEF with vaccines. Um, and that's it. No real medicines, very few health professionals, a lot of campaigns that were run by volunteers. So, you know, what the Walsh and Warren article said is the goal 
of Almada is above reproach, yet its scope makes it unattainable because of cost. So what can we do for very little money? And so this is how they ranked things. Uh, if you had an ability to control, um, and if not, it would fall out. So you look uh, at the top, diarrheal diseases, malaria, measles. We didn't do very well on malaria. And they said effective control, which is not entirely true. Um, but then if you look down here at one of my favorite <clears throat> diseases, tuberculosis, high prevalence, high mortality, control different. So it just wasn't counted as an important intervention. So around this notion of selective primary health care grew a whole um, aid complex um, of the United States uh, creating the aid agency, the U.S. Inter uh, Internet, uh, U.S. A International Development, USAID, um, and they because they did not want to support government salaries, government budgets, because that was against the neoliberal framework, they privatized any aid, putting it through a variety of NGOs. And so what aid looks like in many countries is something like this. You have a very small government budget for health, often an expansive and important national health plan, but very little money going, excuse me, to salaries um, or medicines at the district hospital, the health center, or the community. And meanwhile, you have a large pipeline of money coming in from NGOs. A lot of it goes to overhead and stays in the United States and elsewhere. And then rather than going into the hospitals to pay for salaries or drugs or equipment, uh, it goes to trying to change the behavior of individuals with the idea that illness is not about structural issues, but people's behavior. Um, it pays for a lot of consultants, people like me, who are not going to stay long term. And then there are these ubiquitous trainings that you will see, which people come to a hotel, they drink tea, they watch PowerPoints, they collect a per diem salary, and they're pulled away from the front lines of care. And all of these three pathways are because of the U.S. aversion to supporting governments directly which is comes out of a Cold War idea that big government is akin to socialism. So what you saw from years and years of this, you know, 40 years, are a lot of hospitals that look like this. I took these pictures myself in 2005 <coughs> in Rwanda. And these were actually hospitals. These, this is a two rooms, uh, the pharmacy and uh, actually a ward that were open. Uh, they had staff, even patients, very few, of course. Um, but this is what it looks like. And then people would say, development experts, well, no one wants to go to the hospitals in Rwanda because they believe in traditional medicine or they don't believe in Western medicine. But of course, if you had to take your loved one to a hospital that looked like this, you probably wouldn't go either. Similar things, we, we saw a very high unaddressed disease burden. This is uh, around the same time in Haiti, uh, where we had the job of finding all HIV and TB patients. We knew the TB incidence was about 250 cases per 100,000. So in this one community, for example, we would have expected to see 137 cases, and we only saw nine. And when we were questioned about why the diagnosis was so low, the answer was always, well, it's stigma, people don't trust, etc. But what we knew and came to realize is that without proper staffing, without supplies, uh, without a system to follow up with patients, um, without dignified space, and without supporting um, the opportunity costs of patients from the cost of transportation to waiting for a day uh, for a diagnosis, if we didn't do those things, which we sometimes call the five S's, staff, stuff, space, social support, and systems, um, then you weren't going to get to the burden of disease. So 
we were very fortunate that we actually had the opportunity to do this. Why? Because there was a huge movement around the world of AIDS activists that said, we're not going to take it anymore. We're not going to relinquish the idea that we have a right to the treatment that has moved, um, you know, HIV from being a death sentence to being a chronic and manageable disease. And so AIDS activists and a lot of the work we did at Partners in Health and others around the world started to say, look, it's feasible. And one of the first public uh, treatment programs in the world where people could get treated for free was in Haiti. Um, and I was involved in that program from the beginning. And activists like these in Durban, South Africa said, look, if they can do it in Haiti, we can certainly do it in Africa. <clears throat> we could do it in Thailand. We can do it in Soweto. We can do it in Uganda. And so we, Partners in Health, our treatment of HIV in rural Haiti became part of this story to show that you could deliver health care. And the movement was quite successful. By 2007, uh, they had moved uh, up into the $22 billion a year mark. It's much higher now. It's about $45 billion. Um, and that it was the first money ever earmarked to provide health care as a human right. And particularly in this case, it was health care for AIDS, TB, and malaria. But it served to start the foundations of much improved health systems. And this is just a tiny uh, piece of the story. When we got our first money uh, for HIV in Haiti, we said, we're gonna do four things with the money. First, we're going to put in essential drugs, uh, even though it was an AIDS project, but we said, we're not gonna find uh, the number of HIV patients we would like unless people feel that the clinic has something useful for them. So we did that. We paid the staff. Often public sector staff aren't paid regularly. <coughs> we dropped the financial barriers, whether they were user fees or transportation costs. And we hired and trained an army of community health workers to go out in the community and do act active case finding and the like. And within just a few short months, daily utilization had gone up tremendously, and we were able to find all our HIV uh, cases that we suspected. And that strategy is what we were asked to do in Rwanda when we were invited in 2004. There were only a handful of places where people could get uh, HIV therapy, um, and they wanted to have us at Partners in Health help them set up a system whereby these resources could uh, expand access through, across the country, but expand access integrated with primary health care. So the government of Rwanda did very well at that. And what we, we have learned from Rwanda, uh, which is the government that does this best, is if you can have enough leadership to really tilt that NGO money not into parallel streams of work, but into supporting the national plan, and then use the train the trainer money, the drinking uh, tea money, uh, to at a university for formal training, uh, you know, not sit in a PowerPoint, uh, you know, and, and uh, in a hotel, but actually what is the hands on practical training that people need. And in Rwanda, using this model of, you know, um, really trying to align NGOs with the strategic plan, you can see one of the steepest drops in child mortality in human history. So where does that lead us for COVID? I'm just gonna wrap up with a couple of slides. So how do we think about health as a human right in this country, in the United States, which is wealthy? Um, just at the very end of 2019, there was something called the Global Health Security Index published by Johns Hopkins University, the Economist Intelligent Unit, and the New excuse me, Nuclear Threat Institute. And they broke down preparedness into these uh, six spheres, prevention, detection, rapid response, health system, and compliance with global norms and risk environment. Um, with the idea that, you know, can countries that are delivering healthcare also deliver this kind of readiness? And so according to this um, 
this institute, the United States came way up on the top, as you can hear, see over here. Um, and countries like China fell further down. Um, here's Rwanda down here, um, another country that uh, has done quite well. Um, and, you know, here's the U.S. So um, we know that, in fact, uh, what happened was the United States had the worst epidemic in the world with a million deaths for 350 million people. Um, and Rwanda has had only about 250 deaths, uh, which if it were at the size of Rwanda, that would be significantly lower than the United States. So what, I, my, what I've certainly experienced is that countries like Rwanda, like, like Liberia, where I am now, have gradually built public health systems, even though the hospitals are still weak, they have invested in public health, they have learned a lot of lessons, and they have a more holistic environment um, to provide care, and they've done actually much better against COVID. And I think one of the reasons I bring this up is the question for those of you interested in American health care, um, do we have an equitable and just health care system? I would say we do not. And in each of these, whether it's prevention, detection, compliance, it's important to look at our disaggregated statistics and say who's getting these, you know, care, who is not, what are the gaps? So um, I will just say that people will say that, a, uh, that Africa is aid dependent, but as we can see, it's, it's actually we who are dependent on Africa. Each one of you has a, a cell phone. That cell phone would not exist if it weren't for the metal uh, of coltan that was, um, that was uh, you know, is only mined in the Congo. So how do we think about healthcare as a human right um, taking into account the history of impoverishment? How can we use reparatory frameworks that will contain adequate inputs, money, staffing, et cetera, to assure access to high quality of care and financing that should really come from a cosmopolitan and global commitment to human rights. So I'll stop there and thank you very much. And you caught me yawning. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Mukherjee. So now we're actually gonna move on to some questions that we have. And then um, while we ask those, everyone in the audience, if you would like to submit any questions that you may have either in the Q&A or chat, depending on how you're watching this. Um, yeah, so the first yeah. So yeah, I'm reading the first question. Yes, I mean, I, I think there's good evidence to that, that you know any social programs were sort of tied to the idea of socialism and communism. And that started really ramping up in the 50s, of course, under the McCarthy era. But we even see it today, you know, when Obamacare was first passed, the, the critique was it was socialist. And certainly the Affordable Care Act is not socialist. I mean, it subsidizes people buying into a private market of insurance. Um, and, you know, when we look at the, the type of people that Trump appointed to human uh, health and human services, Department of Education, whatever, people would say, oh, they're idiots. No, no, no. They're actually ideologues that want to privatize the public uh, commons. Right. So if it's Betsy DeVos wanting to privatize schools, if it's um, Alex Azar and Health and Human Services coming from Big Pharma that wants it to be privatized. And so that kind of neoliberal argument is still very much going on and we're suffering from it inter internationally as well. Right. We have private uh, companies, Pfizer and Moderna, who've made the mRNA vaccine and there's no political will to get them to share that technology. Um, and so, yeah, I think we're, we're living in this kind of still stuck in a kind of post-Cold War era, which is bizarre. Um, so another question that someone was, much of the audience here today is composed of undergraduate students from a variety of disciplines. How can they get involved in global health work or achieving that goal of health as a human right? 
Um, you know, I think I think trying to understand, you know, what human rights work is, um, in my opinion, you know, there are two really clear things one can do, right? One is work um, on the government side, either as a government person, an intern to see how the sausage is made, you know, but also by lobbying for um, policy change. And there are a lot of student groups um, from Globe Med to, uh, um, uh, I mean, there's there's a bunch of them, uh, that, that AMSA, American Medical Students Association, uh, that, that will do lobbying on con Congress about issues that matter about healthcare. And in fact, if you remember back a couple of years ago, I know you guys are young, but it was very high profile when the Trump administration and Paul Ryan were trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And it was a handful of activists, like probably 3,000 that stopped that. And so, it, you know, that kind of pressure on the government works. We still do have a democracy. And so if you make your voices heard, it can be very important. And then the second thing I, I think is to, um, you know, try to work with people who, who, who know things that you can learn things from, you know, there are really good activists in many communities and they might be working on different things. They might be working on fair housing. They might be working on education, but you can learn a lot from seeing how, you know, activists organize themselves and everything. So I think one side is trying to pressure or work within the government. And the other side is really kind of getting familiar with how community engagement works um, and, and finding, finding some of that. Great. So another question that's been submitted was, when people think of global health work or global health care delivery, the narrative often shifts to medical mission trips and unsustainable volunteerism experiences. How do we shift away from this in order to build sustainable community-led health infrastructure? Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm glad you asked the question. I think the most important thing is to just think about what you're doing um, and what you're getting um, out of it versus what you're giving. I think um, one of the ways we've done this at Partners in Health is rather than have a brigade, um, which costs a lot of money, right? If you add up everybody's plane tickets and lodging and everything, um, you might be much better off paying for one nurse or two nurses for a year. Um, and so supporting actually the salaries of workers um, trying to help from a framework of saying, you know, healthcare is really about a longitudinal commitment. Um, and if you're going to volunteer someplace, really volunteer where there are local people that you can learn from. So you don't reproduce a kind of colonial um, hierarchy and mindset. So there are plenty of places that will, you know, take young people of goodwill, but it's important that those places have local people running them so you can learn from them. Yes, of course. Um, so another question was, you said that you're a student of social movements. What was, mm -hmm. the moment, what was the moment or event that you decided to begin traveling down the path you're on? Um, you know, I think I was always really interested in this. My father was an immigrant from India. I saw really severe poverty at a young age. And I think I was just very interested in trying to make sense of the world where I lived with so much privilege and people I saw in India did not. Um, and then I happened to, you know, be a, a product of the moment. I, the year I started college was the year the first cases of AIDS were identified. And so I got very interested in that and ended up going to Africa as a young person. And um, that was about 30 years ago. So uh, I never sort of gave up on that. Somebody asked about the trade gap. Uh, I'll read the question. Places like Africa, where you show there's a large export of goods, how is there still a gap in healthcare? I mean, that is that's the question, right? Because Africa is the wealthiest continent by far, by far. Um, diamond, platinum, gold, uh, coltan, you know, oil, uranium, um, but none of it is controlled by African people or African government, governments, with the sole exception of Botswana, 
which actually does control their own resources and as a result has a per capita income more than 10 times higher than many of their neighbors, has universal access to healthcare um, and education. And so, you know, I think the legacy of colonialism is not only the exploitation of people, but the ongoing extraction of resources for companies named things like Royal Dutch Shell, right? That's a Niger, you know, that's a company that's pumping oil out of Nigeria um, or Anglo Gold, uh, which the Anglo part is, you know, uh, and that's in Ghana. So, so you know, this is the legacy of colonialism, and even for governments to tax that here in Liberia, the number one company is Firestone, an American company. They pay zero taxes to the Liberian government. So, you know, this, unless we can change this, you know, the, uh, the idea of this, uh, Africa will continually be impoverished by these flows of capital. So another question that just came in, um, you talk about the foundations of developing formal health intervention through funding for HIV, malaria, and TB treatment. How do you continue developing those programs to expand support to treat other illnesses and build more effective health systems? Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it, I, I'm not a disease focused person, nor as partners in health uh, disease focused NGOs. We, we have the idea that if you build it, they will come. And so provide you know, staff, drugs, primary health care, secondary health care, and then you open the door. And what you see is the whole burden of disease. And you iteratively try to respond to that with, you know, increased capacity on the side of the staff, um, different drug procurement. You know, we have places in the world that we do chemotherapy. I mean, that didn't start right away, but we've gotten there. Um, and so it's really, and you know, most governments in the world, I mean, ours is kind of an exception, in fact, because most governments in the world want to provide health care for their people um, and as, a, as a public deliverable, you know, as, a, as part of their governance. And so, you know, we always have very good partnerships with the government and, and do things together and try to just keep improving health care. And so if you have AIDS money, justify using it broadly and still deliver on the AIDS targets. Um, yeah. So I think that kind of relates to another question that someone asked in terms of the U.S.'s willingness to spend on healthcare and provide healthcare to its people. Um, they mentioned, they say, you mentioned the need for substantive inputs, including money, to supplement the U.S. health system. Do you suggest that this increase, this requires an increase in U.S. per capita expenses in healthcare, which are already high, or do you suggest a more targeted focus on primary health, which is cheaper and has been shown to be more effective? Yeah, so first of all, I want to clarify that I was not suggesting in inputs into the American system because I do not understand the American system at all. I've worked um, in the global south for most of my adult life and did a little work um, during COVID, and I was so horrified at the state of American healthcare. So I'm not really sure what needs to be done in the US. But I am absolutely sure that in the world's most impoverished countries, we need more money. Um, you know, the health budgets, uh, the drug budget, I was just talking with the Minister of Health today in Liberia, the drug budget for the entire country is $2 million. Um, and she estimates what they need is $22 million. So how can you possibly provide good health care without more money when you have such limited input? So we just need some kind of international effort, as we had with HIV. This is not impossible to say there is some basic standard of dignity um, in health care that we, we have to sort of help finance. Yes, that definitely makes sense. Um, so another question that came in was earlier, you talked about a tension between human rights theory and practice. How do you bridge this gap in your own life and practice, knowing that your goals may not be realized in your own life? Um, to me, the theory aspect, uh, which is really that government should re respect, protect, and fulfill rights, and that civil society should demand rights and participate. Um, 
I think that theory has to be questioned through a, a new lens in the era of globalization. And the lens I would suggest is to think about what is our collective responsibility? Because there are a lot of governments I've worked with that have an enormous amount of goodwill to provide health care for their people, and yet they have no resources because of this architecture. Um, and if we had allowed that to be the end game for HIV, we would never have saved the 27 million lives that have been saved. Because we said this cannot be the responsibility of a poor government alone to do this, and we have to all pitch in. So I think um, thinking about strengthening governance in health, but funding um, delivery of care around the world. And I think I'm going to have to go pretty soon because I'm totally fading. It's, it's 1130. Yeah, no worries. Uh, we have one last question, I think, uh, or one more question, or two more questions, if that's all right, and then we'll... Okay. Um, firstly, are there any good online sources that compile data on the groups and efforts that go on at a local level to better the community? You know, not that I know of, um, but, you know, I think you had you would have to ask a little bit more of specific questions. There are good online data, um, like uh, uh, Statistica is one and the, you know, but you have to ask a specific question like per capita expenditure on health or um, the health statistics. The other is the WHO um, statistical, I think it's called WHO stats. Um, and they have, you can look at infant mortality, you can slice whatever you want uh, for whatever geography. So there are, there are some places that have it, but, um, you know, poke around. I'm sure there are some really interesting things I've never heard of. Um, and then the last question is, someone viewing global health and human rights from a background in technology, how can technology and software reach? I mean, look, we'd be dead without technology. Um, when I first started doing this work, there are no cell phones, no internet, nothing. And, you know, now we can consult, we can do telemedicine, we can examine patients together with our trainees. And so there's a wide variety of ways from inventory management to electronic medical records to telemedicine um, that have really been enormously helpful. And there are a lot of tech people now and in, in global health. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukherjee, for taking the time out of your day or night in your case <laughs> to speak with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody here learned a lot as I did as well. Um, okay. Thank you again. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everybody.